Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. All right, everyone, welcome back to our series on movies we love and movies we hate based on how historically accurate or inaccurate they are. Joined with my co-host, Steve Guerra. Steve, how are you? I'm great. All right. Well, we've looked at a lot of different movies. We have looked at movies that we hated, and it's hard not to because the vast majority of movies get things wrong about history. Some get it pretty right. We're going to look at one that you like, and we'll see how accurate or inaccurate it is, and that is The Green Berets. So the Duke, John Wayne, has fought many times in World War II. He's fought many times in the Old West. Now he's going to win the Vietnam War for us. So can you set this up for us? In this movie, The Green Beret, it came out in 1968, which was a pivotal year in the Vietnam War, which we will get to in a moment. The broad overview of the movie is the adventures of the famed U.S. Army Special Forces Unit, The Green Beret, during the late 1960s, during the height of the Vietnam War. The movie's based on a 1965 novel, and the movie features the song The Ballad of the Green Beret, which was written and performed by Green Beret Staff Sergeant Barry Sadler. And believe it or not, this song was number one on the 1966 Billboard Top 100 for five weeks. Like, it blew away, like, all of, like, the songs you think of for the 1960s, like the Mamas and the Papas. Like, it, a song about the Green Beret like the most patriotic song you could ever hear in your life, like go YouTube it right now was the number one song in 1966 for five weeks. And I think it was on the top 10 for several months. Yeah. Not the Beatles. It's a song about a military unit in the Vietnam war. Take that hippies. (laughs) The movie revolves around the main characters of Colonel Mike Kirby, who was played by John Wayne, and the great David Jansen playing the hard-edged, jaded, cynical reporter George uh, Beckworth. All of this, the movie, it was based on a novel written in 1965, and it's probably worth discussing the novel just uh, for a second or two, because that sort of bolsters the historical accuracy of the movie. The novel was written by a... Harvard student who had a connection to the current commander of the Green Beret at that time. And this, um, I believe his name was General Yarmouth, but I'm not exactly sure of that. But one way or the other, he got this um, person who wrote the novel to go through the Green Beret training. And somehow or another, this, the writer, the author of the novel, got his hands on some top top secret documents and you might say oh you know top secrets i mean we've heard this before and things like the da vinci code <laughs> but apparently they were he did get his hands on these documents of actual operations that the green beret had done specifically in vietnam because the pentagon prosecuted him and the the US government went after him for getting his hands on these secrets so there probably was something to it But some of these operations that were detailed in the novel, The Green Beret, made it into the film. Going back to the movie, some of the uh, the other notable cast member was George Takai. Yeah, Mr. Sulu. Who plays an, an Army of the Republic of Vietnam Army officer, and Jim Hutton, the father of Timothy Hutton, who plays the uh, comic relief goof off sergeant role. So, I mean, you have a well rounded uh, cast there of the the goof off, the hard bitten cynical reporter, the um, you know the the Vietnamese guy who actually wasn't. I think uh, George Takai's from uh, Korea. Now, the reporter Beckworth, he's attached to the Special Forces unit to see how they operate and report back to his paper. And he's just, he's cynical of the war and of the Special Forces. 
but he's not cynical enough. Like he's plays like the squared away reporter. He's not hippie at all, which kind of shows this movie was filmed in 1967 and based off of a 1965 book, but was released right around the Tet Offensive. So a lot changed between when the film was released from when it was filmed and from the book that it was made on. I mean, it was really the Vietnam of the early 60s was a lot different than the Vietnam of the late 60s. Hmm. You get the good old-fashioned um, training montage at Fort Bragg, which is the actual home base of the Green Beret, and then the unit is deployed to Vietnam. And there's a lot of slice-of-life scenes on base in, the, in Vietnam. The main Part of the movie takes place of the defense of a large forward fire base in South Vietnam, and the base is staffed by uh, special forces, the Arvin, the, the, that's the Republic of uh, Viet of South Vietnam Army, and then the Montagnards, who are a tribe of uh, people who lived in the mountains of Vietnam, and they were really fiercely anti-communist and fiercely anti-North Vietnam. They show a lot of aspects of the logistics of the Vietnam War, including forward bases, forward fire bases, close-in air support. They featured um, support from Douglas AC-47 spooky gunships, they were called. Uh, they were also called Puff the Magic Dragon. They were essentially cargo planes that were completely loaded with firepower and these forward bases in Vietnam, they would be completely in enemy country and they would be constantly under attack and they would call in these things like these gunships that would just unleash unbelievable amounts of firepower. They also featured M16 rifles, which were fairly cutting edge at that point. They were just starting to be deployed they, uh, the film also uh, showed the use of embedded journalists, which was becoming a thing back then. They, it was a, done a little bit differently than, say, during the Gulf War or the, um, the later uh, Iraq War. They showed long-range patrols, which were a huge part of the Vietnam War, the, um, the so-called – they called them um, – search and destroy missions that was a big part of vietnam and the the film just generally captured an earlier phase of the war before the tet offensive and the use of special forces much more so than conventional forces they the movie also got it definitely was more of a perspective of special operations forces which were highly trained highly motivated volunteers compared to the conscripted soldiers portrayed in many other films. Uh, the novel was actually written by a guy named Robin Moore, and he wrote he wrote some other nonfiction and some uh, fiction, too. Um, I mean, let's not get it wrong. This movie is very, very pro-military and pro-Vietnam War. And as you imagine, in 1968, it got horrific reviews <laughs> when it was released, but it was a solid box office success. So it was showing something that people wanted. And this is really, it's not the first time or the last time where the critics hated a movie, but it was, it had a solid box office success. I thought this, I uh, found a little bit of a portion of a review from Roger Ebert when the movie was released in 1968. And so he said, quote, but propaganda is what we got in the Green Berets, a heavy handed, remarkably old fashioned film. It's supposed to be v about Vietnam, but it isn't the military adventures we could see from any other war in one the enemy attacks a camp and the two sides shoot at each other. I mean, that's the movie, 100%. And really the way John Wayne filmed his movies, this was one of his last, if not his last movies. He filmed movies way past the time where they should have, they were just being filmed in a really different way. I mean, this isn't too much longer before, like films like Apocalypse Now. Yeah. He's filming a late forties movies in the 19 in the late 1960s and things had changed a lot. Um, 
it was filled with the stock characters like George Takai and Jim Hutton. And then the, there was a little boy that they rescued. But it was – I think that it was a feel-good movie. And maybe that I, because I'm removed from the whole Vietnam era. I mean even my parents were a little young for Vietnam. They didn't have a big – investment in it and so clearly i didn't i think you could enjoy the movie for the fact that it showed a really different vietnam than you got in a lot of other movies yeah i guess um well if you're pro this movie then we we always take opposite sides and i have to take the negative side but the two of us also muddle things constantly so um (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think we were saying there's some positive elements where, like Roger Ebert's review, his point, and I think there's something to it, that he, there, John Wayne is using stock characters. You could see it as the, sa- the exact same template as his many, many Westerns or World War II movies where he's fighting North Vietnamese instead of Indians. He is um, giving – he's. He says it's the right thing to do because we gave our word, which could be something else that he could say to Apaches. But this, I mean, bef- the, with the Hollywood Revolution, when you have your Jack Nicholas's or is it Nicholson? One's the golfer, one's the actor, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> get them confused. Uh, the Robert De Niro's, everything else that's happening in Hollywood where you want gritty realism. And like you said, John Wayne harkens back to a very lunch pail approach to acting where he gets in, he gets out, he says his lines. It's always John Wayne. It's always the same cadence. Yeah. Uh, Another movie we're going to do for this series is The Conqueror, where John Wayne plays Genghis Khan, which I think is (laughs) the most glorious miscasting um, that ever happened because they they use the, I don't know what you call it, Mongol face. So they give him the um, uncomfortable, make him to look, to quote unquote, look Mongolian, but underneath, oh, it's Genghis Khan and He's in uh, The Greatest Story Ever Told, where he's one of the centurions who crucifies Christ. And he says, truly, this man was the son of God. And it, it, yeah. it's John. <laughs> he was it's, John Wayne. It's always John Wayne. You 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 <laughs> get what you pay for with John Wayne. But that's it was, it was a sim- different era of Hollywood, like you said. And this shows, too, I mean, with when we imagine periods in history, the most – Iconic people of that generation do not speak for all members of that generation. So we can't imagine that in 1968, it's not like Forrest Gump where you assume everyone is a hippie and everyone is a protester. There were strong pro-war parts within American society. I mean, they may have been of the older generation, the World War II generation or the silent generation. But even among baby boomers, there are probably people who are pro-military Part of why John Wayne wanted to make this movie is he was virulently anti-communist and he had the Johnson administration's explicit blessing. Now, the Johnson administration probably knew things that the public didn't know at this point, so they wanted to do whatever they could to put a positive spin on this. Um, so that's sort of the kind of the what's going on behind the scenes here that can at least make some more sense of it. Because if you watch clips of this on YouTube – it, it looks very hokey compared to how contemporary movies are done. But um, so I think that is the valid criticism that John Wayne is just swapping out stock figures that he would use in his Westerns or his World War Two movies. And he'll he'll make statements where this is another John Wayne characteristic where he's not really speaking to someone. He looks off into the middle distance and it's as if he's speaking with destiny or fate itself. And. <laughs> One of the lines in there, and I think this got a criticism from Roger Ebert and many others, is the only due process out here is a bullet, which, um, nah, I don't know, John Wayne. Like, I get that war is hell, but we also have the Geneva Convention and War Crimes Crimes Tribunals, and maybe that's him trying to, like, put the hippie idealist journalist in his place and let him know that with guerrilla warfare, things are ugly. So, yeah, that is, that's something to it, but it's sort of that kind of speaking with destiny itself, John Wayne thing that happens in the movie from time to time. The movie even did show a scene of torture where they had tortured a North Vietnamese soldier to find out um, a key piece of information. And of course the, you know, he writes it off that, um, you know, that they needed it, but I mean, they didn't sugarcoat it. He's saying it was necessary but they do show a scene that was uncomfortable. I don't think it wasn't as completely 
um, candy, cotton candy, as what the, like, say somebody like Roger Ebert would say. There was a 